Hello everyone, and welcome to this Nintendo Life. My name is NBZ, and this is episode 47. Bally, in 200 episodes time, we will have a very insider joke that we'll probably make, and no one will understand. That I'm sure everyone will get by the time we get to 247. Yes, but 247 is apparently, according to your mathematics, about eight years in the pipeline, (laughs) so we've got time. We've got time to think of those jokes and to make those jokes when they're relevant and and to meet that episode when it comes. But today, it's just a regular show, and we're going to be talking about video games and other things and loads of stuff. So, Bali, tell people what the show is going to sound like this week. So we're going to talk about what we've been playing. As usual, we have some of your emails. And then a story that's been floating around the news um, recently. Um, Former uh, Treehouse localizer, employee uh, Chris Pranger was on a podcast called Part-Time Gamers um, recently. And he said enough stuff to basically lose his job at Nintendo. So it's all quite dramatic. There's an awful lot he talked about. Um, So we're going to talk about some of the things he mentioned um, and just sort of the controversy of it all and who's in the right, who's in the wrong and get a This Nintendo Life court order on the situation. Yeah, indeed. It's uh, it's an interesting topic um, and kind of, you know, goes into wider spheres about Nintendo and PR and all that stuff. So we'll dig into that later. But uh, before we do, let's dig into the games we've been playing. Bally, you finally finished Yoshi's Woolly World. Oh, I did. And that ending of that game is just not much fun at all. I just, it is not impressive in the slightest. I did not like the final boss. Um, It wasn't particularly hard or difficult. It was just a bit predictable and boring um, and I actually think the end game of a game like uh, Yoshi's Island is far better um, than what the ending of this game was and they actually copied a few elements from Yoshi's Island um, in the final boss and the final um, part of the game um, and I should say they copy so much from Yoshi's Island in general throughout the whole game but um, yeah I don't want to talk about it much really because I'm, I'm just I'm a bit negative on it. Because you can't say anything nice about the game, Bally. I don't want to... I don't... I mean, Yoshi, he's so close to my heart when it comes to Smash Brothers and oh, trolling no, you. So not, I don't, uh... So I don't want to... I don't want to, you know, break his little dinosaur heart. So I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give Yoshi a pass on this one and hope the next time he can bring about um, a slightly stronger um, outing. Um, so other than that, I've been playing a lot of Splatoon. We both have. The new yeah, DLC is awesome. Been loving that. Um, I went around to a friend's house, my friend Alex, who owns a PlayStation 4. Oh, a magical crazy device that exactly. we've never heard of. <laughs> and it's so funny because when we're setting up to play games on like a PS4, I know absolutely nothing about how the controllers sync, how the menus work, um, all that the playstation network accounts and things you need to sync in the controllers and i'm just a massive noob which so that was funny in and of itself um but played a ton of rocket league with alex and i have to say i absolutely loved it it's really easy to pick up and for those who haven't heard of rocket league although i'm sure you will have by now it's basically yeah everyone's talking about it it's football but you play as cars um, and it, it sounds is... ridiculous. It sounds like the worst concept for a game in history. Exactly. And yet but it's... everyone is saying it's amazing. So what, what were some things you liked about it? Just how well implemented the controls are and how easy it, it is to pick up and play because it literally controls like a, ra- a regular driving game. Um, you've got your boost button, the accelerator's on the shoulder, you're steering, um, you're picking up boosts a bit like items in Mario Kart almost to charge up your boost meter. Um, and then the, the unique part is that you have a jump. And then, so you press, I think it's the X button to jump. But then once you've jumped, there's a range of things you can do. You can press forward and jump again to do a forward flip. You can do X and back to do a back flip, like a bicycle kick. You wow. can even jump then boost in midair to like soar into the sky and then press your second um, X. So you can sort of jump, soar, and then bicycle kick. So you can do some ridiculous sort of aerial maneuvers to reach the high balls. And and that is a big factor I I found in this game is being the first to, to make contact with the ball when it bounces high. Because most of the time, and very newbie players like me, 
we just wait for the ball to just land and try and get first touch. And that's what the vast, vast, vast majority of players do. But there were some guys online who would just basically jump, boost, soar into the air, and then just like backflip and kick the ball back and like score crazy goals. And it is just there's an awful lot more skill to it than meets the eye. Um, and how were you and Alex playing? Were you playing as a team going online with split screen? Uh, was we working? played as a team going online as a split screen, yes. Um, but Alex wasn't a big fan of the split screen because he'd been playing it only like single player f- with the whole screen. So we sort of yeah. alternated um, a bit but between us um, and we were mainly doing two on two matches um, oh interesting I've heard a lot of people say that three on three is kind of the, the yeah. standard one that they like to go for we tried a bit of three on three it's pretty hectic um, and I don't know if I prefer two on two or three or three they were they were both good um, three on three it's a bit like people are just I feel like not enough of the world knows how soccer or football works. Like, it's just frustrating. Right. The really funny thing about listening to people on podcasts talk about Rocket League is the Americans slowly understanding that you don't just chase after the ball like a crazy (laughs) person. Because, you know, this is the first thing, you know, when you're kids, when you start playing football, is everyone just runs straight at the ball. And that's the main focus. And no one thinks about, like, positioning and staying back and, you know, playing playing your role in the field essentially exactly and, and then they yeah. come to this realization eventually that oh this is how you actually play and because none of them have the context for soccer it's like they're learning these theories through of this video game it's kind of funny mm. and and it makes a massive difference having i love playing uh defensive midfield in that game so a bit of goalkeeping a bit of basically waiting around the halfway line waiting for the ball to cross in and then boosting up the field and trying to get a front flip on the cross to score a goal. Like, that is absolutely what I love doing. Uh, The breakaway goals are great fun as well. And there's just so much um, exciting, like, gameplay that you just don't really think about. And like we've said, the concept sounds a bit dull, but it's absolutely amazing. Um, And I highly recommend you pick it up, Emmy said, because it is... It's great. I don't think the hype's going to die down anytime soon, basically because it's such a great game and it's so unique and innovative and different. Um, and yeah, so absolutely loved that. Uh, we we also played a little bit of N++. It's sort of like a 2D uh, platforming, get to the goal kind of 2D platform where you can jump off walls and things like that. There's loads of obstacles. Um, that's got a really interesting mode that's very Mario Maker-esque where people can make all their own levels and upload them and they get ratings. So we played a few levels people had made that are absolutely crazy. Um, that's a pretty cool game. Um, and I also played... Uh, Alex bought Shovel Knight a while ago and he I know he had sort of not burned out on it, but he'd sort of stopped about halfway and I was like, Alex, we've got to play more Shovel Knight. So we blasted through a few levels and then obviously because he's got the PlayStation 4 version, I was desperate to try out the Kratos um, fight, right. um, which was great fun. Really enjoyed that. Um, I think it, it's such a nice addition and I'm super hyped for what Nintendo do later this year um, in relation to the Shovel Knight DLC because they've said they're going to do something. Which um... Yeah, I don't know if that will be in the form of like this having a Nintendo character as a boss or a stage. I mean, because Microsoft got Battletoads and Sony got uh, you know, God of War stuff in there with Kratos. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know which you know franchise would work the best for Shovel Knight. Um, there um, are certainly quite a few you could throw into the mix. Yeah, I, I think it has to be Mario, Zelda, or Metroid. I'd be surprised if it's something outside of those three. But yeah. We wait, we'll wait. we wait and see. Um, but then the main game I've been playing um, a lot of, well, about it took me about eight and a half hours to complete, is Guacamele Super Turbo Championship Edition. Yeah, because, you know, there aren't enough subtitles in the world. <laughs> Precisely. Um... And for those who don't know, this is a this is a, a Metroidvania style game, but calling it a Metroidvania style game is almost underselling it because it, I feel it does so much more to that formula. It does its uh, it does its own thing. Um, screw the blaster. Who needs a blaster? Who needs projectiles? Let's let's get in on brawling because this game loves brawling, and it's it's very clever because the core mechanic I found is. Um, 
melee combat moves that are based on colors. So you have your horizontal punch, which is blue. You have your vertical punch, which is red. You have a down stomp, which is green. And you have a neutral headbutt, which is yellow. And these moves are core to both the brawling in the game as well as the platforming. And that's my favorite thing about it. Exactly. Like they, they have these moves, but they are multi-purpose. Mm. And, you know, I continuously go on about things like the Beetle and Skyward Sword and how I love it because it's multi-purpose and it does so many different things. And this game's entire you know, mechanics are built around that idea. Which and, what, is and what works so well is that unlike your um, Super Metroids, it's far more like Metroid Fusion. It's incredibly linear um, and it forces you through through challenge rooms effectively. And these challenge rooms are sometimes platforming based and other times they're brawler based where you'll get hordes of enemies coming at you. And I love how it mixes up the two and keeps it really fresh. Um, and I really don't think this game would have worked as well if it was trying to be like Super Metroid. Um, it works nicely that you're forced through quite linear passages through... Um, they're very, they're very similar to dungeons, and they often have final bosses. And I think there's about maybe four or five of those areas in the game. Um, yeah, I mean, it's much less about exploration exactly. and much more about execution on, you know, either fighting enemies or getting through platforming mm. uh, stages. So it certainly does kind of come from the fusion mold of things. And, and there still are like towns that feel quite. Um, Shovel Knight Zelda 2 uh, Right, kind of, and I mean, it's all really nice. well-themed, right? Because Absolutely. you are a luchador. You're mm. in Mexico, and you... Basically, this the, the idea of the brawling works because that's kind of this fighting style, this Mexican fighting style. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, all your moves kind of thematically fit uh, within the system. It's so. like, I know so little about Mexican culture, but I know that they have a big emphasis on the world of the living and the world of the dead. Right. And this game plays on that massive where the main character one actually dies at the very start of the game yeah no spoilers it's just like literally you start the game exactly. and that's what happens um, and then you get your mask which basically brings you back to life and turns you into a luchador and then that's another mechanic that they have is the dark and light world um, and they don't focus around it very much early on in the game but as you get to the later part of the game it's almost like portal or something where there's different different enemies appear in different light and dark worlds and different platforms appear in different light and dark worlds so those two key elements the brawling and the platforming get completely turned on their head later in the game um, as you're unlocking these power-ups and you eventually do get the power-up where you can't swap between the light and dark world um, at the press of a button um, and i should say that the game takes itself doesn't take itself too seriously and there's tons of jokes there's tons of references to metroid which i absolutely love um the biggest one being the chuzo chozu statues i think they're i think yeah so the, it's a it's a same idea of the chozo but they've spelt it incorrectly basically yeah and it's just those are where you get all your power-ups and there's plenty in the game um and <laughs> You can turn into a chicken instead of a instead of a morph ball and silly things like that. And it's just such a well designed game. The art style is perfect. The, the 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 music is incredible. It's so you know very stereotypical Mexican trumpets everywhere. Um, it's got some of the some incredibly tough bosses. Um, now I found the final boss the toughest personally. I know you found the second final the second last boss pretty tough NBC. oh yeah i mean uh, javier the jaguar is one of the hardest bosses i've had to face in any game and, i'm so and surprised by this like... at the time you know when i was playing this everyone was talking about how difficult it was and how challenging is this you know 2013? getting through this part uh it was yeah i think maybe 2012 i can't quite remember it was a while ago wait didn't um, you didn't you own this on pc no, I own. Well, I do because I I got it through a humble bundle at some point in time, as everyone does. Uh, but uh, I bought this on launch day on PlayStation. This was originally a PlayStation exclusive. It came okay. to other platforms later. But I bought the original edition on PS3 day one. And um, yeah, you know, back then I was listening to podcasts beyond and Colin and Greg are going off about how difficult this one boss was and how they spent ages and ages on him. And you came on Skype the other day and you're like, oh yeah, I beat that boss like fourth time. And I was like, what the f <laughs> what? Really? 
Um, so either Bali, you are a golden god at Guacamele, or they did something and made him easier for the Wii U edition, or like yeah, later down I the line know. they rebalanced him in some way. I'm not sure. I mean, because I definitely it took me about twenty minutes, half an hour to beat the final boss. Um, I found that super tough, but I mean, in general, I think the boss battles are great. There's about four of them. I think in this version, there's like five of them because they added a boss and an actual yeah, area. Yeah, you, you started talking to me about a boss that yeah. I had never seen before because they just added a whole new area to the game. So there's like an extra 45 minutes to an hour, I'd say, of just like another area with a boss. Um, and I know that it's also got the D- DLC bundled in into this one um pack which is right yeah pretty cool and it's so seamless like as someone who's playing it blind i don't you can't really tell what's been added what's not been added it's just yeah yeah one long experience so it took me like eight and a half hours so it's quite short but i mean cannot recommend this game highly enough i know we recommend so many games on this show all the time but i mean this game is super cheap on the wii u eShop. um i think it works great on the wii u um i had the map on the on the uh, gamepad screen while I was playing it on the main screen it works incredibly nicely the art just style like uh, SteamWorld Dig exactly Same just like SteamWorld there. Dig um, it's short but it's such a rich experience um, and I'm not even annoyed that it was not longer I know that's a criticism some other reviewers had uh, but I absolutely love this so super yeah. happy with Guacamelee and... I'm not someone who really focuses on story but I think like that aside i think the writing in this game is really good like it's, yeah. it's pretty funny at points and it's it's you know the, it takes a great tone um and i thought you know the dialogue it's, was just well put together it's an interesting story it's not obviously nothing nowhere near the selling point of this game but it's you like you said the writing the comedy it's a bit raunchy it's a bit out there it's a bit different and it's so yeah. nice um especially for a style of game like this um, so yeah, massive thumbs up from me. Um, I need talking of Metroidvania, MBZ. Oh boy, what have we'll you been get playing? There. We'll get there. Um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm really glad that you played Guacamelee Bali because we have these conversations about how you are so. <laughs> let's say I wouldn't say pedantic. I would say it's a hard word. <laughs> methodical. To think of. Yes, methodical. You're extremely methodical when it comes to playing your video games and the yes. order in which you're going to do it. I, I, and forever and ever, <laughs> I kept telling you, Bali, play guacamole. Play guacamole. Do it now. Play it now. I have this principle. It's like it's like a mum will tell their child when they're younger. I'm not buying you a new toy until you play with the ones you've got. It's that ethos that I'm, I try to keep true to myself. I say, I need to complete the games I previously owned before I buy new ones. So therefore... If I buy a new one, such as this that was on sale, I have to complete a, a few others first. Yeah, well, I'm glad you finally played it, because this is like one of those games that, in my mind, is one of the best of the last decade. So Yeah, um, I yeah. agree. And this is going to yeah. rank pretty highly, I have a feeling, for my game of the year, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, that was, it's coming up. A few months. We're very close to the end of the year. Crazy, I know. But uh, we're getting there. Uh, anyway, I guess I'm going to talk about some video games that I've been playing. Um, I guess we should probably segue into the Castlevania game that I've been playing. But I played that second, so I think I'm going to leave it for, to talk about second. The game I'm going to talk about first is Mega Man X. Um, you guys know that I played the uh, original Mega Man series, uh, you know, notably two and three, uh, two last year, and I played three earlier this year. Um, two is probably my favourite uh, out of those, and three is just. I think three Hardcore. is a good game, but it's ultimately way too fucking hard. Like, it's just kind of agonisingly difficult. Um, but I still enjoyed it. Uh, so, uh, having done that, you know, those are the ones that people talk about in that original series, I wanted to try the Super Nintendo version, you know, the Mega Man X series, which is where they, you know, make the graphics much prettier, and they add some new powers, and they make Mega Man a little bit different, and um, I went into this expecting it to be, you know, a bit of an easier game, a bit of a more kind of light-hearted in tone, and, you know, a simpler, not so difficult, and Bali, I was wrong, because Mega Man X is every bit as difficult as the Mm. original Mega Man games, it is still pretty tough, Um, so it's follows the same structure which means that you have eight bosses and you can go about them any way you like there's probably like a recommended order because some of them 
obviously they are all weak to each other's power-ups, so you could go into one and he'd be really difficult to defeat without having the power-up from another guy. So you have, you know, I think the hardest thing about Mega Man games is deciding where to start, because the only thing you have at your disposal is your buster, is your kind of standard weapon, which you can just pea shoot. Um, and in this game, the buster is a little bit upgraded, because you can now charge it, like a charge beam, essentially, like in Metroid. Uh, and not only do you have the peas, but you can just hold it down, and, you know, while bosses and while enemies are kind of running around and doing their thing, you can have a shot ready to go, and instead of, you know, taking off a little bit of damage, you'll take off a larger chunk. Uh, so the charge beam is a big factor that, you know, comes into play. And there are a couple of other things. Uh, there is a dash move, which is akin to the slide in Mega Man 3, but it's much more intuitive for me anyway. Like, when I was playing Mega Man 3, I kept forgetting about being able to slide and, uh, you know, go under enemies, and maybe that's why I had a difficult time with it, because getting that core concept in my head was just not happening. Um, whereas this dash just, it feels like a more modern game concept uh, in a sense and I think there are a lot of games like Mighty Number no. 9 which is coming out I guess next year now because it got delayed uh, has a dash ability built in which you can actually do anywhere in the air you don't have to just be on the ground with it but in this game it is you know it's it's a very useful thing and I you know, made a, a great deal of use of it. The other really cool element is wall jump, and this isn't your traditional, like, back and forth thing, like in Mario, where you go from side to side. This is, like, Super Meat Boy, which I know is a weird reference to make, because Mega Man came way before Super Meat Boy did, but it's the, it's the kind of wall jump that you can continuously jump up the same wall. So okay. you can basically make your way up a single uh, flat surface, um, and that is used in many areas. There are many more vertical sections in this game and some of them are just downright fucking infuriating because even in the Super Nintendo era they still have the problem of enemies respawning if they go off screen so there was this one area I think it was like kind of in Wily's castle in the later stages where you basically have to go up this vertical shaft and there are platforms in between but on the platforms there are enemies and then sliding on the walls are other enemies and then also flying down above are flying enemies so you have all these enemies in your way you have to wall jump up while defeating them at the same time which is really difficult to do because of all the angles that are in place and all the you know bullets and shit that's flying in your face and you can get up to the top and then oh no you get hit by an enemy you fall back down and by the time you go back up again they've respawned so it's just like it's this horrible infuriating nightmare nightmare of a mess of a thing and it that is like 100 percent mega man like creating these horrible situations that obviously when you complete them is very satisfying but you come up to them and you're like fuck why why did you do this to me it's just like super infuriating um so those parts kind of uh rubbed me a little bit the wrong way but um yeah overall it's just it's so slick it it looks really nice it of course being a super nintendo game it holds up so well these days uh very cartoonish aesthetic to does, it does it hold up better than the nes games that's interesting. I think they both kind of hold up similarly. Like, they're both very playable to this day. Uh, I think Mega Man X certainly works more within a modern context because it has a lot more colour and vibrancy and it's it's kind of the thing that you would expect like, make, you know, maybe an indie developer to be able to make in this you know current climate. Um, so it wouldn't look out of place, you know, in the new releases charts on Steam. Um, so maybe in that sense, Mega Man X holds up better. But in terms of control, in terms of playability, they're both pretty similar. Um, so yeah, I think I think you can you know easily go ahead and, and try this out. And I think Bally, you should probably give Mega Man X a go at some point. You think this is the the prime candidate to test out after Mega Man Two? Yes, absolutely. I think you you probably don't need to play 3. I think 2 is kind of the defining original Mega Man game and mm -hmm. and X offers like a similar experience but slightly edited and you know there are Few, would you say fewer or more safe states will be needed? Oh jeez, I oh, probably the same. similar amounts. Similar. Yeah, probably similar amounts. I didn't abuse safe states too much and actually one of the things I wanted to do from the beginning was if I went through a stage the first time, I decided, like, I'm not going to use any save states for, like, the first three or four times I go through this stage, because part of the joy of Mega Man is 
traversing through a level and learning it as you go and figuring out where the enemies are and what wow. you need to do in a specific that's situation. That's pretty hardcore. <laughs> but no, I, I just think like that's kind of the true way to play that game. Oh, I think definitely. For Mega Man 2... I had more of that inbuilt in me because I had played it at your place before and I True. knew some of these levels. So when I came to it last year, I had more of a familiarity. Like I could go into Bubble Man's level and kind of get through it first time with no trouble because I'd already had the hardship of trying it and failing multiple times before, right? I'm, so I'm, wor I'm worried you're going to take this ethos onto other NES and Super Nintendo games. You know, you shouldn't. Like, you shouldn't worry about this. That. Is the way that they. <laughs> were meant to be played therefore i can just imagine you banging your head against the wall with like link's awakening or something yeah like what is this no no i i i just think for me and for the way that Mega Man is meant to be played that's kind of part of the fun is like becoming a master and you know people like colin moriarty who have been playing these games since they were children basically have muscle memory and memorization to the point where they can just go through this level which to the layman would be impossibly difficult and not even sweat they still can't beat that jagger and guacamole though no yeah clearly he's he's way too, way too hard <laughs> um but yeah there's there's yeah loads of cool stuff in this game um there's actually an easter egg uh, from Street Fighter um, once you collect I think it's every energy tank and every health upgrade that's the other thing in this game is you can it's really cool because you can go back into the levels you've already beaten so the boss stages and there are hidden secrets in there so you can find extra energy tanks which like in Metroid if you die and you have a, a spare reserve thing it will bring you back to life or in Zelda like the fairy it'll uh, well it won't bring you back to life but you basically have it's a potion just call it a fucking potion it's basically a potion so you have those um, and then you have uh, health upgrades your health starts kind of short and you extend it and the bar gets longer as you go through but the interesting thing is going back to these levels is depending on what you've done in another stage it affects things in the stage you're currently playing through so one of them is called flame mammoth and his stage is like very lava focused and, and fiery but if you beat chill penguin who is like the frozen stage before you beat him you get to this certain area and instead of there being lava it's all frozen over so there's like some effect has happened here where like these stages have influenced one another and because of the frozen lava you can go on top of it and find a secret that's hidden below that you wouldn't be able to get to before if for some reason you'd gone after Flame Mammoth before you'd gone after Chill Penguin. So really cool that like there are tangible differences in the game world because of the things that you have done and uh, that's not something I really expected from a Mega Man game um, which is great it's really cool um so yes Mega Man x it's a classic and it still holds up really well to this day um, do you have another Mega Man you want to try after this i don't know i think maybe another one of the x games i'm going to have a look and see which are the recommended ones um but i think at this point having played two three and x those are kind of like those are the holy trinity of like the games that you should play uh, in the Mega Man series so I've done that and you know I'll probably want to branch out and try some other stuff so we'll, we'll do that eventually uh, the other game I've been playing is uh, as we spoke of before Metroidvania it's uh, another Castlevania game and I said Bally at the start of this year it's the year of Castlevania for me and this is We're your playing. second this is my second we're in August it's my second uh, but uh, obviously I wanted to play through all of the games the GBA ones uh, that they released on the virtual console I'm kind of going in chronological order of when they were released so having played Symphony of the Night and then moving on to Circle of the Moon I am now playing Harmony of Dissonance and this game is very Symphony of the Night influenced much more so than Circle of the Moon was um, you don't have a sword like you did in you know that classic but you have a whip instead your character looks very similar to Alucard though he has a very kind of similar vibe to him despite the fact that he's actually a Belmont and his name is Juiced Belmont look I'll be honest the story I didn't pay attention to at all because it's Castlevania you go in there and you fight Dracula and that someone dies probably and turns into an evil thing but most of the time like the writing's not great I kind of just skip the dialogue because I didn't care enough um, Castlevania isn't about that for me it's about going in exploring a space get, finding upgrades learning new abilities and 
beating bosses and that is the core of what harmony of dissonance does um the difference in this case is that the castle is kind of split into two and again you know similar to guacamole it's like a dark and a light da- bleh, dark and a light world um where you know there's castle a and castle b and you know there'll be different enemies and different items placed within these two areas and you have to traverse between them uh, to kind of pick those things up and yeah it's it's kind of you know very similar to other castlevania games there's not a huge amount i can say about it what i will mention is that there is a kind of it feels like there's an influence from the speed running community in this game because in symphony of the night the way that you move through that game if you're a speedrunner is you attach the shield and there's a move in symphony of the night where you can kind of backdash but it has a lot of lag to it and it's kind of slow however if you alternate between pulling up the shield and doing the backdash it becomes super glitchy and basically you just fly across the screen at crazy breakneck speed and in this game they kind of implemented a similar thing it's a dash but the dash is just as fast as that and you can just spam it you can just hit the trigger buttons and go da, 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 and it really makes traversing the environment so much easier and so much more fun uh, because in Circle of the Moon, as one of my criticisms of that game was that you had to double tap the D-pad just to run. Like, your general walking speed was so agonizingly slow, and for some reason they thought it was a great idea in order to run to double tap the D-pad every time you had to go fast, and that was that was terrible. It was such a bad design choice. Uh, yeah, I, I, I swear I've played some game in the past that's done that, where you double tap to run. Um, yeah, I, I feel like sucks. a lot of games back in the day did it. It was a very co- sort of Game Boy heavy thing to do. Right, it's almost because they don't have enough inputs. Exactly, like they have yeah. A and B, so A is jump and B is use the whip. So it's like, uh, what do? Okay, how do I run? How about maybe just make your character run from the first place instead of walking as your normal speed? Uh, so yeah, that's one of my criticisms of Circle of the Moon. Harmony of Dissonance, however gets around that problem very nicely you can just dash around places and i think the game is just easier like i had no trouble at all even you know the final boss was no problem i just steamrolled him and there are multiple endings if i went around and found all of the remains of dracula and brought it there and then he could turn into a thing and you get the actual real final boss and the good ending but i played the game for like 10 hours at that point i was satisfied i'd, I'd played you know everything and not had much trouble and it was just Yes, it was easier, but I think it was a more enjoyable experience because in Circle of the Moon, I had to just endlessly grind and grind for so long because there was this one boss that he just he stood in my way forever, and there was a period of time for like a week where I just wasn't playing the game because I didn't want to just sit there and grind. Basically, you, you often fall out with games, MBZ. I've noticed. Yeah, this. you say that boss is too difficult, and you just put it away for a week. And you're like, I've fallen out with you, not speaking to you. And then after yeah. a week, you're like. Do you want to wake up now? I'm going to try and yeah. do this boss. <laughs> and yeah. you get on with it. Yeah. So th- that was my experience uh, with that one. But this game, much smoother, much more fun. And uh, now I'm glad that I've played it because apparently the third Game Boy Advance game, which is called Aria of Sorrow, is by all accounts the best one and is one of the only other Castlevanias that in critical uh, reception has rivaled the original Symphony of the Night. So, yes, I look forward to playing that, and I hope I'll do it before the end of the year and uh, close it out with a bang. So, there we go. A uh, couple of games from the Super, or in the Super Nintendo style, I guess, because GBA and and Super is, Nintendo. And is that uh, third one out on Virtual Console? Yes, all three of them are out. You can oh, wow. buy all of them now. So they're on North American and European Virtual Console. Uh, so all the GBA Castlevanias are there. Uh, for your playing pleasure, I guess. So, go ahead and do them. They're good. Uh, So yeah, that is going to close us out for this section. Uh, We'll be back in a second with some more discussion of your emails. So don't go anywhere. We will be right back.
Hello everyone and welcome back to the show. It is part two of the show and that means one thing, that means it's time for your emails. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to say a massive thank you because, you know, we were running out of emails last time. Uh, we put out the call and I'd, I'm happy to say that, like, we got lots of emails. So we'd like to say a massive thank you for that. Um, and obviously we have always, always need more. So if you do have anything else you want to write in about, our email address is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. We really appreciate any of your emails, any of your questions, any of your great stories that you send into the show. Um, so our first email is from John. Hi, I'm Ms. Adam Bally. Recently, I found myself listening to video game music as I go to bed. I find that there are a lot of songs in video games that are extremely calm, such as Dire Dire Docks from Super Mario 64 or the File Select theme from The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. I've also found that there are an abundance of calm video game remixes, for example, an amazing jazz album of Ace Attorney music. Now, on to my question. Are there any songs from video games that you find are extremely calming and that I should add to my playlist to listen to? Thanks for reading this. John from Iowa. Well, uh, John, we, we both listen to game music and we've talked about it in the past. And obviously we have a segment dedicated on our show to game music itself, uh, but not necessarily calm game music. Um, but I know like you time to time tend to listen to some video game soundtracks when you're doing work and stuff like yeah. that because there's no lyrics involved and so you can have like this kind of nice background ambience going on without being distracted from what you're doing. Exactly. Um, I, I am doing a lot of job applications right now and it's nice just to have something there like and like you said the fact that there's no lyrics means I don't get distracted and I have to say the number one thing I love listening to um, while working is Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze soundtrack now I've, I've praised this game to death on the show um, including the soundtrack but it is such a great soundtrack um, I have to say my top three songs and I wouldn't say that they're necessarily all calm but definitely A Miss Abyss is definitely calm and that's a remix from the original uh, Donkey Kong uh, Country um, Did you hear it when you played through that original? Yes I did You didn't actually. notice it at the time? Oh absolutely well yeah no I did but I knew I was looking out for it as well mm. so yeah oh, okay. um, no I absolutely love that song and I, I do prefer the remix in Tropical Freeze um, but Seashore War is another one can't even say that Seashore War um, <laughs> and then Homecoming Hijinks which is like it's the big operatic quite heavy hitting epic one um, which I wouldn't say is necessarily relaxing but I absolutely love those three songs and just you know David Wise just absolutely blows it out of the park for those um, for the soundtrack and he has been confirmed to be working um, on God, I've forgotten the name again what's the name of that game that's coming out ukulele ukulele so I am super looking forward to the soundtrack of that game so that those would be some of my picks okay and no other games. You're oh just yeah, I mean, double down on Donkey Kong here. <laughs> I love um, the link between Wild soundtrack. We both own um, yeah. a hard copy of that. Actually, a good point uh, on that soundtrack is a lot of the songs that are played in the bar are great because they're very kind yes. of low key remixes Absolutely. of old Zelda songs. So even if like there's a Zelda song that's kind of upbeat and like really kind of not necessarily calm the version that they will do of it with like the flute and the some string instrument i can't remember what they have in, in the, the game. mandarin the mandarin or mandolin mandolin uh, <laughs> yeah 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 that's a, no, let's not that's make a that fruit. mistake yes. yeah uh, let's not do that uh yes yeah, so those uh kind of stripped down versions are really cool i really love ballad of the goddess in those yeah but i, I, I yes I, I think that game that sorry that song is very loud and no 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 calm, I mean but... the the re the um the, the version of it they do the, exactly the version of they okay. do in that game um I also yeah, well... I, I also uh, yeah, I also own the soundtrack to Super Mario Galaxy I absolutely yeah. think that is very relaxing lots of sort of bings and bongs and quite space <laughs> sound and thing bongs. oh very much so yeah they're like these synthesized sounds um which are quite nice um, so those are all sort of the relaxed ones I definitely like listening to. Definitely Xenoblade on the side, although I know yes. you've got a few things to say about that. Yeah. Um, and then 
I've got to mention some just like really heavy hitting stuff that I obviously won't listen to while I'm working, but I just absolutely love Shovel Knight, Hole of the Usurper is probably my favourite 8-bit tune of all time. I just absolutely love that song. Um, and just one more mention is sort of the butt rock from Sonic. Just so, so many songs <sighs> Why in would Sonic you say that, that, that are just... They're just super cheesy and terrible. I admit they're terrible, but out of that lot, I think the, the main theme from Sonic Heroes is quite a quite a gem. Oh my god, Bali! But oh, that's that's bottom of the list. Bottom of the list. The rest is uh-huh. better. Don't worry. Don't worry. Mm-hmm. All right. Well. <laughs> so when you're kicking back and relaxing, what do you listen to, MBZ? Well, yeah, I I don't tend to listen to game music that much. Um, I did. A little bit a few years ago uh, at uni I would in the library kind of stick on the Xenoblade soundtrack and have that obviously because as we mentioned earlier it's no lyrics apart from you know the ending theme uh, and so there's nothing to really distract there it's it's very kind of you know background ambient stuff I, there's so many like great epic tracks from Xenoblade but there are also amazing calm soft like melodic like very slow songs I think uh, the nighttime theme from Valak Mountain is one of those which is very calming and, and really nice to listen to uh, there's one called Memories which I'm not sure what part of the game it's from but I just went through the original soundtrack uh, on YouTube and found that one and that sounded very relaxing um, and then there's another one which I can't remember what it's called and I can't find it and it's driving me insane but it goes like <laughs> is it Magna Forest? it might be Magna Forest I'm not sure I don't I'm not know. sure but hey if uh, if you can recognise what that song is from my and what's the song with lyrics at the end? Oh, I can't remember what it's called now. That's a good one too. Yeah, but that's the ending song. That's, that's the, the ending final song. It's a one. bit. It's a bit special. It is very special. It's quite hard it? to access. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it takes um, about ninety hours to get. To. <laughs> <laughs> or a hundred if you're Bally. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so obviously, lots of picks from Xenoblade. Um, a couple of Final Fantasy ones as well. For me, uh, Final Fantasy Thirteen has a stunning soundtrack. Really excellent. I know a lot of people hate that game. I'm a fucking, you know, I'm an evangelist of Final Fantasy XIII. I love it. It's great. So many good things about it. Uh, but the music is probably one of the highlights of it. And uh, Sarah's theme is one that I am a big fan of. I think that is an excellent track. Probably the one that stands out the most. It's used pretty frequently throughout. So you'll probably recognize it if you've seen or heard any Final Fantasy XIII before. Uh, the other one is Tazanakind from Final Fantasy X, which is a very somber, very kind of... It has a lot of minor tones in it, um, and it is it is very kind of emotional song as well. I think it's used kind of late on in that game, um, but it's uh, that's a special one. That's a really like well known tune, but it's it's a great kind of relaxing slow one. Um, and then very recently, I played Ori in the Blind Forest earlier this year, which sports a stunning soundtrack. And uh, one of them, which uh, I picked out, is called Naru Embracing the Light. Uh, it's so kind of upbeat and happy and delicious. To, delicious? Where did that come from? Uh, it's nice to listen to. <laughs> I was like, uh, wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's great. That's a great song. That's it's it's. I always find it difficult, Bally, to articulate what i like about music it's very hard like i feel like oh, it's impossible going into like music journalism would be next yep, to yep. like impossible because there's just no way in exactly. language to really express like how a song sounds and i so. mean we have so many tastes in common and we, but we never really discuss why we like a song we just say hey I'm, i've heard this really great song by this band x let's listen to it and then we just go Oh, that was so good, and that's all we can say about it. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh, that one bit where they do that one thing with the yeah. thing, and then yeah, it's hard to kind of. We discuss never go. Oh, that. it was just delicious in my ears. <laughs> it was just it's so hard to describe. Bali, all music is delicious. All music is I, delicious. I mean, especially some of the these songs we've been talking about. Yes, exactly. Um, so there you go. There are some picks for you. Hopefully, you add those to your playlists and keep enjoying some chill music. Anyway, on to our second question uh, this episode. Hello, MVZ and Bally. How are you? It's Tom again. With E3 being and gone, I noticed there 
were two 3DS Zelda games announced, so that means by the end of next year there will be five 3DS Zelda games. So I wanted to know, do you think Nintendo are overusing Zelda? People always say all Nintendo do is put out Mario games. So do you think this is a problem? If so, how can they fix it? Thanks for the show. Watch everyone. Much love from Tom. Well, yeah, this is kind of interesting because... Bali, you keep asking me, oh, what's the second Zelda they announced at E3? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's it's a port of Hyrule Warriors That's on 3DS. That's not a Zelda game. Yeah, well, Blast, it, it, it looks... for me. That counts. It's part of the franchise, Bali. It's like, you can't go saying Mario Golf's not a Mario game. It's a Mario game. You know, Mario's in it. So, it, <sighs> it's... It, it, look... Yes. By the laws of franchises, it's also this... a much better game. <laughs> yes, well, that's look. We'll ha- we'll not have that debate because that's not what this is about. Um, Bali, do you think that Nintendo used Zelda a bit too much, or is there another reason uh, for all these games coming out? It's hard to say. Is he like Zelda is definitely the big one after Mario, um, and if that wasn't clear. In a few years ago, it's definitely much more clear now, especially with a game like Triforce Heroes or something coming out. There's, they're really, you know, five 3DS games. That's an absolute ton. Um, I, I don't think it's a problem because normally all those games sell pretty well, and it's that's fine if Nintendo want to make some money and they want to sell well. I don't, and I don't actually think of those five 3DS games. I mean. Like we've already, I've already hinted at, I honestly think Hyrule Warriors is probably the only one that I'd be disinterested in. I think the other four are all games I plan on picking up at some point. Um, and obviously I've played um, Link Between Worlds and I'm playing Ocarina of Time 3D. I, I think that, hey, if you've got great classic games like Majora's Mask, like Ocarina of Time, I think the ports of what I've played so far are great. And if they want to make a bit more money doing that, then fine. I do think it is worrying that so much light can be shone on franchises like Zelda and Mario and other things like Metroid or, in my case, Advance Wars F-Zero gets shunned to the side. Um, It is quite frustrating uh, from a fan perspective when certain uh, franchises are so incredibly consistent. And obviously Mario is the most so more so than any by far um it is quite frustrating when certain franchises are in the spotlight all the time and others are shunned but that's that's just the way the market works and that's how nintendo feel is best to spend their resources and that's understandable it's just a bit frustrating from a fan perspective the money has to come from somewhere bali and apparently the money comes from that mustachioed plumber over there in the corner Mm. so uh he he brings in the bucks and uh you can't blame him for it um i think really what it comes down to is Nintendo have said, and they're kind of discussing this around E3 regarding Metro Prime Federation Force, is they want to have their franchises con- more consistently in the limelight, right? So on 3DS, yes, there are five Zelda games, but one of those is an original Zelda game. Two of them are ports of existing old Zelda games. One of them is a port of a Wii U game. And one of them is a multiplayer-centric, non-canon entry in the series. So if you really strip all of that away, there's only one original single-player-focused canon Zelda on 3DS. Mm -hmm. Which means that, yeah, like they're not really overdoing it when it comes to the core entries in the series. It is like Mario and Mario Golf, like you were saying earlier. Exactly. And I think it's it's smart. Like it's the sort of thing that they know that Zelda is a franchise that can still sell, but they don't have the development resources to make a new entry every single year and make it consistently different and fresh and interesting. And they don't want to fall into the Assassin's Creed trap of just same thing year in, year out with hardly any differences and just graphical upgrades because that's not Nintendo style and that's not how they like to treat their IP. Unless it's 2D and, Mario. <laughs> well, yes, of course. There's there's the one pitfall. <laughs> Until um, now, Mario Maker, but yeah. Yeah, anyway. yeah very true. Um, but that means that, yes, if they want Zelda to stay relevant and to be in people's minds and for them to be thinking about it consistently and talking about it consistently, they have to plot out you know release dates for games that don't necessarily fit you know the standard zelda mold and they have to 
make these weird multiplayer things and then port this Wii U game to keep it, you know, it in people's minds because otherwise, if it starts to disappear, then maybe people will be less excited for the next main entry. If they're always thinking about it and they're always looking forward to something in the future, then it just kind of keeps the train rolling, if you know do, what I mean. Do you think there is an argument that people might now be less excited about something like well, we obviously know um, Federation forces something, but say F Zero or Advance Wars, for example, something that's not come out for years and years. Do you think they're in danger of people forgetting about those franchises and thinking, "Oh, I'm not that fussed about it anymore"? I, I don't think they're in danger of people who know about those franchises forgetting about them. I think they're in danger of losing them as having any sort of brand identity whatsoever. Mm. They could come out in the next year with an F Zero game, and I think that there are, will be a lot of people who are younger who have never experienced any F-Zero game in their life and they will treat it basically as a brand new thing and to some extent that could work to their benefit. I mean look how well Splatoon has done. It's a brand new IP that no one ever heard of before and it sold gangbusters and done extremely well and F-Zero could come out and practically do the same thing if it is marketed in a smart way and if people think, oh my god, this is something new Nintendo are doing because they don't have the pre-knowledge that this is a long-running series that has just had an extremely, extremely extended break. Um, so, I don't know, it could work in one of two ways and hmm. I'm not sure how that would shake out. Yeah, interesting points, interesting points. Um, any Any more to say on that or shall we move on to the yeah, Final I mean, question. in the end, I don't think they're overusing Zelda because they're not releasing canon mainline entries. They are exactly. padding out their lineup um, by having ports and by having, you know, different styles of games. Nothing so. they've released out of those five games makes us any less excited about Zelda Wii U. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's, it is, like we said, it is that core canon that they are very careful with the, it does only come out every four or five years or so that I think works really well and as long as they stick to that and don't try and impinge on that too much I think it's all good it is indeed so our final question this week is from Alex Dear MBZ and Bally it's been a very long time since I've written to you guys so it seemed like a good time to shoot your question despite the fact that there are many licensed games that are well loved like the Arkham games, the Traveller's Tales, Lego games and DuckTales to name a few. There's still a stereotype that licensed games in general are bad. Do you agree with this stereotype? If it is true, do you think it is because publishers rush developers in order to cash in on a franchise that is popular at the time or do you think there is more to it than that? If it isn't true or isn't true anymore, where do you think the stereotype came from and how do you think marketing teams can get gamers to aban get gamers to abandon that notion. What do you think are the best and or favourite licensed games? What do you think are the worst or worst licensed games? My favourites are Toy Story 2 for the N64, the first three Harry Potter games for PC, Injustice Gods Among Us, and pretty much all of the Lego games. My least favourite is probably the GBA game based off the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe movie. Why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> Finally... MBZ, this question is directed mostly at you, but Bally, feel free to contribute. Why do you think there haven't been any Doctor Who games despite the immense rise in popularity the franchise has seen in the last few years? If you could make a Doctor Who game, what would it be like? What genre would you want it to be? Which Doctor or Doctors would you use? How would you incorporate the gamepad, etc.? Thanks for everything, Alex, who on Twitter is at AtariAlex um, from the great state of Texas. Oh, well, Alex, uh, a lot of questions that you've sent to us there. We'll, uh, I guess we'll start at the top. Um, he asks about the stereotype of licensed games and them always being bad, and publishers basically, you know, spending, uh, not spending much money in rushing development. Um, do you think that that is a true thing? Uh, and it's... is it still true today, basically? I think when we were growing up, it was more true than ever ever like oh, that absolutely. GameCube Xbox PS2 generation and they, even the start of PS3 Xbox 360 we the number of movie tie-ins that would just come out at exactly the same time be absolutely terrible games they'd sell pretty well 
and like they are definitely on the decline like i can't even think of the last movie time game to be honest and there's it's not just there's just as many summer blockbusters if not more than there were when we were growing up and I just can't think of like movie tie-ins, so I think yeah, it's like where is our Avengers game? Where is our Hunger Games game? Where is our Twilight game? Like all of these mm. mega franchises that you would think by this point in make time a bit of money would off. have a yeah, they'd want to make some quick cash off of a game licensed tie-in, and they just don't exist anymore. And I was listening to another podcast, I can't remember which one, but they were saying that really the role of those licensed games have now been relegated to mobile devices where you can hmm. easily shit out a Hunger Games game or app or something to tie into it. And not only, number one, is that going to hit a much bigger audience because of the widespread nature of smartphones, but that audience is probably going to be more relevant to hit because they are mainstream and because these movies hit that kind of audience. Uh, and so despite the fact that they have kind of disappeared on console, they've moved over to phones instead, mm. and that's where they now live. Which... That's so nice, isn't it? They're sort of purifying the, the console market right. a bit, getting rid of all that crap. Yeah, uh, just kind of tossing nice. it off to the side. And I have to say, the examples um, you've given, Alex, like I've not played an Arkham game yet, I definitely plan on playing them, but they seem to have just absolutely revolutionised the market for what a good superhero game can look like a good licensed game right and i think the key thing with the arkham series is that it is not based on a single movie no. or television show or series it is based on a franchise and it is done with care and love and attention to detail but they're not tied down they're not bound by the constraints of a script from a movie department they can make whatever story they want to and fit the character to it and therefore fit the game to it and that's the kind of the same case when it comes to the lego games although those are much more based around the narrative of films and and franchises but because of their light-hearted nature and their kind of goofiness they can kind of yeah. get away with it yeah they're putting that lego twist on everything so it doesn't feel like it's churned out necessarily in the same way no, and there is a, there's a charm in the Lego games. Like when I played Lego Lord of the Rings last year, to the scene where Boromir is getting shot in the chest, but he's getting shot by fish and other stupid shit instead of arrows. So they kind of turn this sad yeah. scene into a comedy, um, yeah. which is pretty funny. So, yeah. Do you have a favorite licensed game? I'm trying to think, like, what are the ones that I've played and what are the big ones in my mind? Um, I think both of us would probably say the Jackie Chan game on Game Boy Advance. <laughs> that was a great a bit of a classic. back in the day. Oh, yes. It's a really solid, mecha like, mechanically, it's pretty solid as a game. And that's directly based off the TV show, we should say. It's, right. Yeah. But they didn't. I don't think they really strictly adhered to anything in the show. They, I mean... Oh, no, they did. Those bosses are from the TV show. Right, the bosses are, but like the levels are based on areas, but they're not based directly on what exactly happens in the show. They kind of take an environment and mold it to fit a video game level, you know, yeah. kind of beat 'em up level, um, which worked pretty well, and we enjoyed it at the time. Obviously, we we're kind of very naive back then, mm. so. I mean, yeah. we played, I played a couple of horrendously bad licensed games growing up. The most famous, probably Tarzan, oh, um, geez. based off the Disney film back in, yeah, that back was in the bad. GameCube days. Um, uh, I mean, Alex mentions Toy Story 2, and that's a great one, actually, on the yeah. PlayStation. I played the PlayStation version. I of had it, a but... PC demo of that game, actually, and thoroughly I think I did as well it. at yeah, some point. It came with some um, free newspaper back in the day in the UK. Yeah, um, but it was really cool, that game at the time. Like, it just the exploration elements and like going through the story was it worked really nicely i um, definitely had a bad experience with a harry potter game boy advance game mm. I, th I believe it was the philosopher's stone the first one um or as it's called in north america the sorcerer's stone yes because um, yes. apparently there uh, aren't philosophers in north america or something it's <laughs> weird that that came out on game boy advance because there was also a game boy color game for it. yeah it must and be, I, I owned the game boy color game oh, and weird. that was really good that game was basically a standard rpg but in the harry potter world and it was great like when i think about it like Aside from Pokemon, that's like one of the first RPGs that I played, which is kind of crazy. Um, but that's what it was, thinking back. I remember you playing that, actually, yeah. 
Yeah, it was really good. It was pretty damn awesome. Um, I had a bad experience with a Game Boy Color game for Monsters, Inc. Oh, um, okay. That wasn't great. Um, I remember you had uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Emmy said. Oh, boy, yeah. I mean, that's like, that's one <laughs> Based of the on first the video games I ever finished, uh, <laughs> oh which is God. weird. But yes, the Sabrina, the cartoon. <laughs> you were like, Pally, why did you tell everyone this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It was fun. I don't know. It was a fun game. Our standards game. back then were so bad, weren't well, they? Well, they really? weren't standards because we were children. Exactly. So we didn't have anything to really... Like, that's... It's one of those things that you get to a certain age and you start critiquing things and realising that not everything is amazing anymore. Yeah. And for me, like... I think it happened around the time the third Harry Potter film came out in terms of movies, where I walked out of it and I said, there were flaws with that and I didn't like this and this and they didn't do this part and that was wrong and it wasn't done and like I was thinking wait a second this is like the first time I've criticised a piece of film which is strange and kind of strange that I was having that self-aware moment but yeah you get to the point where you realise that all this stuff is kind of trash but there are some actual legitimately good licensed games based on movies. And I think probably the the biggest one is Spider Man Two, which oh, both yes. of us had yes. a great time playing. You owned it on GameCube. I absolutely loved that game. And there was this one day where we were at your house and we just played Spider Man Two for like four hours, and then we went to my house and we just played it for like four more hours, and we just couldn't we get didn't, enough. Of yeah, it. It, it's a great story. It's a great open world environment, like su- such great mechanics. And I have gone back to it. I think maybe last year or the year before that, very briefly. And it is hard to go back to in terms of visual style, but at the time we were like, this is. The best looking game ever like <laughs> jumping off the empire state building was just such a joy and great physics engine um i never completed that game i'm stuck on like the final boss which is really frustrating um i don't know if i'll ever go back to it to be honest but such a great game and it's it's so interesting because the spider-man has gone very downhill since that game oh yeah um, there were really so has. many poor games and I, I remember them trying some horrendous motion thing with um spider-man 3 on the wii which was just ugh, ugh, horrible but anyway. yeah very very bad uh but let's kind of get to the end here Are you t- talking about doctor who and asking kind of what style a doctor who game i just don't think people like time travel i think that's the biggest issue oh you can <laughs> get out of this that, you're fired bali you're franchise. got you're off the show you're off the show um <laughs> I think that Doctor Who is actually a prime candidate for a Telltale game. And we haven't talked about Telltale yet, but I think Telltale do some of the best licensed work in the games industry right now. Uh, Obviously, The Walking Dead is just incredibly good. It's one of my favorite games ever. Uh, I'm currently playing through the Game of Thrones game, which so far has been a lot of fun. And I think they could do a really good job with Doctor Who. I think actually Doctor Who is going to be involved with Lego Dimension. So there's going to be a Mm. Lego version of that floating around. But um, absolutely, Telltale could do a smashing job with a Doctor Who series. Um, I think it would be great and it fits their mold because it's a tv show so it's like episodic there was some doctor who game i swear on something last generation yeah i think giant bomb did a quick look of this side scrolling doctor who game and it was awful it looked terrible and it was bad in in all areas so the other thing is that like that's owned by bbc and like i don't think the bbc have really done licensed tie-ins before necessarily you're not really talking about the big american companies that might have some closer ties to uh games developers so it might be there might be something up there that might make it a bit more tricky to do Um, yeah but i don't think the bbc ever predicted doctor who to take off in north america in the way it has done so no i'm sure they're they're re-evaluating their um franchises yeah well, uh, I think that's going to be it. Uh, no more emails this week, Bally. We, we're we done. But uh, do keep sending them in. Uh, where can they, they send those to, Bally? Please send your emails to thisnintendolife at gmail.com. Uh, we await them eagerly. Uh, hopefully there'll be more stuff to talk about soon. We're gearing up for the release of Mario Maker. Things are going to be happening. We've got so, Mario uh, Maker, we've got Triforce Heroes, we've got Star Fox Zero, and then Xenoblade, like in back-to-back months. Yeah, it it should be a good time. So uh, yeah, keep writing in, keep giving us your questions, and we will keep answering them. But uh, that's going to do us for this segment. We'll see you in a bit after the break. 
for uh, a discussion of some recent news and uh, hope you'll find it interesting. So don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Alright everyone, welcome back to the show for our final segment. Uh, and this week we're going to talk about, I guess, uh, kind of a topical... An incident. Yeah, an incident. That's a good word for it, Bally. Um, I guess, you know, this has been in the news recently, that Nintendo recently fired one of their employees, uh, a guy by the name of Chris Pranger, who was a localization writer at Nintendo's Treehouse. And um, before this happened, there was a podcast that he appeared on. It was called the Part-Time Gamers Podcast. And uh, it was picked up by a lot of places. It got a lot of traction on NeoGAF and then other uh, news sites and Nintendo-based news sites started reporting it. And uh, this guy had a lot to say about the inside workings of Nintendo and uh, basically things that you would never hear, uh, which is probably why... Uh, he was let go. But we're going to have a talk about this and Nintendo's policies in general and how you know tight they are on their employees and, and all that kind of stuff. But when I first heard this news, Bally, when I first heard that he was on the podcast, I was thinking, oh, that's interesting. This must be a guy who used to, who used to work at Nintendo. And he's now kind of talking about his experiences there. Because in my head, like, there is no way in hell that someone talks this candidly and this openly about a company like Nintendo in the year 2015 if you're still actively working for them. I was convinced that he was a former employee, but he... He is a former was. employee. <laughs> well, he is now, yeah. Is but now. <laughs> um, I thought that he was at the time, and he... He uh, actually was working for them. And so when this news was announced that he was fired, I actually wasn't very surprised. Um, let's jump in then, Bally. What are your first thoughts before you listen to it? Because we actually just listened to it recently yeah. so that we could get the full context. So I saw the headlines and I, uh, the sort of first thing that came to my mind was, oh, great. Like Nintendo have overreacted, you know, no freedom of speech, um, big corporate company coming down hard on something that's probably incredibly minor. Um, what a shame, like he's lost his job, he needs to find another job, support his family, etc. He did write a very emotive uh, Facebook post after he, yeah, was, he, he did. found out the news, um, which regardless of how you feel about everything, it was very sad to see. But um I initially had it's just so much, so much sympathy for him um, without hearing the podcast thinking that Nintendo were just out of line, like they could have given him a warning or something or like, and, and I, I was I was putting a lot of sort of emotion into it with very little knowledge, which is never a good idea. So it was very revealing to actually listen to what he had to say. Yeah, um, I do think that, you know, in many ways... Nintendo's letting go of him is something that maybe any other company would do in that situation, uh, given you know the stuff that he was talking about and the tone which he took and things that he was saying. Um, so yeah, it, it perhaps isn't so much an indictment of Nintendo themselves, but more just like this is how corporate environments work. And it's kind of shocking that he didn't get any kind of go-ahead from PR or anything like that because you would have very much thought that if he had explained to people that he was going to go on this show and, and talk, you know, that he would have been taken into a room, they would have sat him down, and a PR person would have said, right, you're not allowed to talk about this, this, this. And you would have thought... <laughs> Plug Mario Maker is coming out in right, September. Right, <laughs> and exactly. Um, <laughs> and we've talked before because uh, Bill Trinan was a guest on Nintendo Voice Chat, mm -hmm. and he is... You know, 
he works at the treehouse, but he really isn't a very localization senior dude. As well. He's very senior. He yeah. he is much more of a PR guy as well uh, at this point in time, and so he knows what to say. He knows how to say it, and he understands that he can't talk about a lot of things. And it's kind of surprising that this guy's worked there for like three or four years, and I I'm not sure what kind of lapse in judgment happened, but. It was very surprising. It was. It's also a really great podcast because it actually Fair. gives you an unmitigated inside exactly. look into Nintendo, which we never have. It's, is, it's such a rare treat, honestly. There is more information in this hour and 18 minutes of podcast than you will have got out of Reggie in the past 10 E3s. Like, it is an unbelievable amount of insider knowledge. And obviously that is why he... Um, had to he was made to leave he was fired but i mean we learned a lot of stuff like and uh, i mean shall we get into it yeah Bally, you have a list of some things so i mean talk about why don't we just talk about them one at a time um sure for me the most shocking thing of the whole thing was probably maybe it wasn't i i'm, I'm gonna go with the library okay so he, um, Chris Pranger revealed that in um, inside NOA, at the, inside the treehouse, they have a library that is full of you know non, not just Nintendo consoles, but also non Nintendo consoles. He was talking about playing Xbox uh, 360, I believe. Um, it was uh, Bioshock Infinite. He exactly. said that he he was talking about his experience playing Bioshock Infinite and was saying that at work they have a library where they can basically loan games out and that took me by surprise the fact that within Nintendo in their treehouse they have other companies products and they allow their employees to play them and they have a library full of these 360 and PS3 and probably PS4 Xbox One games um that strikes me like from the way that Nintendo never mention these other companies and always talk about being their own thing and never you know looking at the competition at all that is a shock for me honestly like that's really surprising um and it's also kind of a positive surprising you know because it means that they are actually paying attention to what Sony and Microsoft are doing at least having their employees you know they're not the ones working on the games but at least these localizers have the ability to you know check out these games and not have to go out on their own time and you know buy them and all that stuff so very interesting uh what were your yeah. thoughts Bally? um incredibly interesting i completely agree um it's when you compare what he was saying to you know the message you will get from a nintendo rep at say e3 they 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 basically never talk about other companies anymore um they never talk about what they don't seem to even acknowledge that their games exist. It's not just not talking about them. It's oh, video games. Nintendo do video games. No one in the else, no one else in the yeah. world does video games. And it's this real kind of narrow-minded propaganda, really. That is just right. so um, difficult to listen to. Um, yeah, uh, I know you in particular, Bali, are very frustrated when the PR hats go on. Oh. Uh, it, it, it Especially sucks Reggie. my soul away. Like, it, and and I, I, all credit to Reggie. He does it with a big grin on his face, and he does right. little, <laughs> little side jokes here and there. I mean, Reggie's a great personality, and he does a good job of being an entertainer as Precisely. well. Precisely, doing it with a smile on your face is the key. Nothing that nothing that comes out of his mouth is worthwhile. It's all exactly. bollocks. So, but what I mean. Um, MBZ, what was, uh, other than the library, what was another shocking thing that you found out or you felt Chris Pranger was saying that was shocking? Well, I think for me, and this has been widely reported on, is probably the one that made the most headlines, was the way that he phrased a lot of the things he was saying, the tone in particular that he was taking when talking about localizing uh, a lot of games that the fans want, but for them don't make much financial sense. You know, he talked about NOE taking the bullet, essentially, on Xenoblade Chronicles, which is interesting phrasing to use, uh about the fact that they basically put up the cash to localize that game and then NOA were like okay well you've translated it I guess we can release it now because otherwise that thing really wouldn't have come out and it almost makes it sound like the whole Operation Rainfall thing 
didn't really make that much of an impact, um, which is, I don't know, it, it's kind of crazy. He, I, I must say, he, he kind of, he had the mic for like uh, massive long stretches of time. You bet yes. it was literally just him talking. Um, often he'd forget what the initial question was. There was a real aura of arrogance that was just incredibly cringeworthy to listen to. A, there was a lot of condescension, really, Absolutely. regarding Nintendo's fans. And exactly. I think maybe that might be something that they were displeased with, because yeah. despite the fact that he was going to bat for the company and saying that all their decisions were smart and all their decisions were correct and, you know, that they just do such a great job, and really being an evaluator evangelist which you would think nintendo would be proud of Mm -hmm. on the other hand he is completely slapping the face of nintendo's most hardcore fans and i think that's the xenoblade fans which is like such a a sensitive point amongst you know nintendo fans and the the big push like you said that there was to get that game outside of japan and yeah how happy so many fans were that um that games now come out in um, North America and Europe. Um, and we, I mean, we've both played it and absolutely love it. So, it, yeah, it felt like he was cutting us deep um, in, in some ways. Yeah. Um, and and I, I completely... He, it's almost like he was just fighting back against the armchair CEOs. And I'll admit, and I'm sure you might agree, that we are very armchair CEOs. Here we are doing our podcast. We've right. said on the show millions of times how we think Nintendo should do things. Um, and, you know, <laughs> we do live in a democracy. We're allowed to do that, and people are allowed to criticize for us for that. But then the mm-hmm. second that you have um, the company themselves hit back at the fans and say, no, they just don't know what they're talking about. Um, it's just not worth the money. That's why it was such a difficult decision. Like, And that's... he's not wrong. Here's the problem. Yeah. Is he's not wrong. He is absolutely 100% right. He isn't wrong. It was the way he said it. Exactly. Um, yeah. It was just... It was strange. It, he was just... There were so many moments of the podcast were incredibly uh, cringeworthy uh, to listen to. Um, and he gave a, one really... Um, interesting anecdote i found was about um it was it was to do with the animal animal crossing yes um on 3ds and so there is no ability i believe where you can't choose your skin color of your character yes exactly Um, the only way to change skin tones is to get make sure your character becomes tanned Mm. which is just this really stupid impractical completely politically incorrect thing right um, and apparently in the japanese version he was saying there was some character that responded to how tanned you were or something so it was like this character that's saying oh you're looking dark today or something it was something well, no that... it, it, it wasn't to do with that it was to do with the fact that if you put on a me costume mask onto your character oh 10 times 100 times worse yeah Basically, so so if you had, you know, if you were African American and you had a me that you know represented that, and you went to the guy who's his name is Captain, I think, who runs the boat, he would remark on the fact that you were very tanned in the Japanese mm. version, and obviously that is horrendously racist, and they could not put that into the um, you know the European or the American version. So yeah. you know they have to get around hurdles like that in local. A lot of interesting localization stories he was telling, um, and 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 for that to even have like come up and been revealed now so many people in a western audience now know how horrendously racist you know the japanese version is and obviously it's their culture etc but now we were given this anecdote that is doing nothing but damage to the to the company and to the image and to the brand that they're trying to espouse and he, he it was just a really clunky anecdote as someone who rep- was representing Nintendo and was proud of the company and proud to work there to just let something like that out is just really daft like really really and that was just the feeling I got consistently throughout the whole podcast was can you like just if you're so happy to have worked to get the job you're in how can you not know the ramifications of what you're saying like surely you know and you know enough about the media and how media pick up on these things that almost everything you're saying is just not not good for your image and your boss will just not be happy also he mentioned like 
two of two different bosses of his within Nintendo. Uh, yeah. I believe one of them was by first name, although I didn't know the name. No, he mentioned that it was Nate Bildorf, who's a well-known well, uh, guy. At yeah, the I mean, house. you don't go on podcasts talking about your bosses. It is just reckless beyond belief, no matter what profession you're in. Like, that is Absolutely. just unbelievable. Um, so I just, I really feel for this guy because I don't, I just don't think he had the knowledge or dare I say it, the intelligence to realize that, you know, he's just making horrendous mistakes. I th- I'm not sure. It, it just really seems like a uh, poor judgment on his part. And I think it was interesting because Johnny Metz on Twitter was talking about how on RFN, whenever they had any guest on, they would always, you know, if the guest had something that they had said that they wanted to cut out, they would say, "Yeah, fine, we'll we'll cut that out for you. There's no problem with that." And you, you're thinking like, this guy really should have said to these guys after thinking about it and after being on the show, being like, "Actually, guys, you know, I probably shouldn't have done that. Please don't put this show up." And even afterwards, he didn't have the the hindsight. Maybe there were elements he did say that. Who knows? Maybe even worse things were edited out. I mean, I highly doubt it based on what I did say. But... No, and it does seem like, listening to the show, it sounds like they recorded it over a Skype recorder. It doesn't sound yeah. produced in any way, and so it doesn't seem like anything was cut. Uh, with with my ears, with my editing ears, of course, uh, I could, couldn't tell any uh, obvious cuts going on there, so... Yeah, As, especially he also mentioned things about Sakurai and his dedication, and I think a lot of keen insights into how much that man kills himself over Smash Brothers and mm. the passion and dedication he puts in uh, as like really Sakurai is the, one of the great auteurs in the games industry like he just wants to have full creative control and be involved with every aspect of Smash Brothers and um, yeah I mean I'm not sure if that's the sort of thing that Nintendo wanted to be out there is like the inner workings of what Sakurai is really doing on Smash Brothers. So. Well, I I think they just don't want their inner workings out there. Um, yeah. Regardless of whether they're doing stuff right or wrong, they don't need the media knowing about that, being able to criticize. Um, and obviously, Sakurai working on Smash Brothers is just part of that. Um, and oh God, the, I mean, the list goes on. Here's another anecdote. Um, was he, he he's voice he voiced one of the the bosses in the brand new Star Fox Zeros. Yeah. Uh, zero zeros. Yeah, zero zero. 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 Um, this isn't Metal Gear Solid. There's no ground <laughs> zeros going Star on Fox here. Zeros. Um, yeah. yeah, he's actually, I believe, according to a NeoGAF thread, he's the voice of the first boss that's actually in the E3 demo that we um, yeah played. Um, so he was they, and they it was just really awkward because they were joking about how. Um, so many of the NOA um, treehouse people voice different uh, uh, characters within, Eng- obviously, the English speaking characters in so many of their games. And he was joking about how he now has good job security because he's, yeah. he's voicing that. That was um, kind of heartbreaking. Star Fox. It's just. Uh, and, like, yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm kind of <laughs> speechless about this all, as you <laughs> might be able to tell. It's just. Yeah. He said so much that I, if I was his boss, I would be livid, personally. Yeah, Absolutely but livid. here's the thing, Bally. I think it was an awesome listen because it oh, gave not, us... I will not deny that. So Absolutely. much. It gave us so much from a company that gives us so little when it comes to how do they do things? How do they figure things out internally? And we can maybe segue this into talking about Nintendo's approach... Yeah. Uh, and in public relations and the way that they present themselves and it's been mentioned before on places and I also pick up on this point that you know Giant Bomb's live show at E3 they often have a lot of industry veterans and very important people on there and they've had before they've had Phil Spencer from Microsoft who is head of the Xbox team basically the the same job as the president of Nintendo in many senses although not as senior because he's still part of Microsoft under you know their own CEO but for all intents and purposes the guy at the very top they've had Shuhei Yoshida on there who is basically the head of first party stuff at Sony and both of these guys are so open and honest and they talk about their competitors and they talk about other companies and things they like and trends in the industry and they are 
genuine. They come across more as real people. And in many ways, yes, they are very PR in senses, but they will answer questions and they will give replies to things which you would never in a million years see Reggie or any executive at Nintendo do the same thing. It really would be inviting Reggie onto the Giant Bomb live show would be akin to basically just playing an advert for that section. It's you would get nothing from it and it would be boring and pointless and you would have no back and forth and it's one of those things that frustrates me so so much about the company because these other companies are doing it so bet so much better. So and, talking of yeah. armchair CEOing, what should Nintendo do then? Because I think in my opinion why not PR train your entire English speaking team in NOA? in the treehouse and say these are the guidelines of how to appear for an interview whether it's a podcast or a video thing or whatever or a live show here's the breakdown you always come to your higher up before you go on have a quick meeting with them about what to say what not to say and we let them go on do you think there needs to be some sort of framework within the company that says we can do podcasts, we can do these live shows, we can do interviews, we can do meetings, but there just needs to be a few hoops they have to jump through or something? Do you think that's getting to something that might please fans? I, I'm not sure. I think certainly after this incident, they will have ha had words to say to their employees. Oh, the whip will have been cracked. <laughs> like It will have been... Yeah. Oh, I, that would have been scary, quite frankly. Um, wow. Absolutely. Uh, but, I wouldn't have liked to be in that meeting room. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> MBZ, court is in session. Is Chris Pranger guilty or not guilty? Should Has the well, right course of action been taken? I think in the modern world, and we're talking about, you know, a very corporate company which has a lot of things and internal workings that they don't want talked about by the law of you know modern times yeah absolutely nintendo were right to fire him and right to take this action because yes they could have given him a warning but then again you know we don't really know the perspective of him as an employee we don't know how good he was at his job we don't know you know whether he had had bad things happen in the past you know, i mean talked on the podcast about whining and moaning about not being able to work on smash brothers i know i was quite interested by that actually and i you know it's it's hard to say like just on the single basis of this one appearance on a podcast it could be a little harsh but maybe there are other factors at play that we just don't know uh which we're never going to find I mean, out if he's if he's exercised um, atone anything like what he exercised on that podcast uh, i i i worry that there will have been other incidents whether he knew it or not that definitely mm. rubbed um certain people within in a way the wrong way um but Maybe. i mean it's the, it, it is if you haven't listened to it, I cannot recommend another podcast, although you must subscribe to this podcast as well, um, highly oh, enough right, then to check out that episode because it is, like we said, you just learn an absolute um, ton about everything. Yeah. From a company that is so secretive, when you get an hour of just pure insight and insider look, yeah, it's it's pretty great. Um I think James Jones made this point in RFN um, and maybe some in some ways counterpoint to like Johnny's question of like why they don't appear on things like Giant Bomb but for me like they were saying that yeah that's kind of not really a setting that represents their company in the sense that they're very you know kid friendly mm. and James Jones made the point that the giant bomb show from this E3 was most memorable for the CEO, not the CEO, but the uh, head of you know Disney Infinity tweeting out the phone number of the CEO of Iron Galaxy yeah. like on a live stream, and those sort of incidences and those sort of drunken shenanigans are probably not the sort of things that Nintendo want to get in on. Do you, do you think he had a, a word from um, a Disney on high executive? Oh, I I have no idea how that would have gone, <laughs> but uh, it must have certainly been very interesting. But I mean, that, um, I mean that's also but... different in a sense because 
he barely talked about Disney the whole night, didn't he? <laughs> he was just, no, no. He well, was I mean, just yeah, that's sat that's the there, of um, the shows. joking around and things, and it was great to watch. And yeah, I I agree. I think yeah. that um, Nintendo's audience, arguably not that different to something like Disney, but oh, like I said, he didn't really talk about Disney. Um, th- that no. giant bomb audience, I don't think. Um, while guys like us who love Giant Bomb and Nintendo would love it, I don't think we're a massive um, um, percentage of the wider Nintendo fan base. Yeah, the thing is, is like, yes, maybe Giant Bomb isn't the right venue for them to go on and do that stuff, but Shuhei Yoshida and Phil Spencer have been on many other shows and done many other things, and every time, for me, the tone that they have and the way they carry themselves is so antithetical to the way Reggie does mm. everything and um, yeah maybe it's just a company thing but it's also like I care more about those people and what they're doing and you know the way they conduct themselves than I do about what Reggie is doing um, so. um, one more point I, I just wanted to say um, we talked about um, what Nintendo could do from here and we talked about how you know we 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 these um treehouse live events um at e3 the the really difficult thing i find is that we are being presented with these faces of nintendo loads of people like you know audrey um drake and like all of that team um all these faces that you never see but you only see them at e3 um and and uh, chris pranger had been had been at the um um you said the star fox zero uh one of the right he was treehouse uh... live events so it's just difficult being a consumer to have these faces sort of thrust into the open, but then they, they're they not available for interview or available for a comment or anything. Like, it's it's very almost yeah. two-faced of Nintendo to say, here, look, yeah, of course we have a face. Here are our faces. Look, here are all the people who are working on localizing all your amazing games. Um, here they are. But then we don't get to see them the rest of the year it's it's a it's so controlled yeah. and it's like like i said i'd love it if they you know, they could just pr trained a lot of them and they had a procedure to go through when it came to interviews podcasts whatever and that we'd actually hear from people like audrey drake throughout the year um about about some yeah. of the games coming out and, and it's going to be very pr based i i get that that's fine but they, they there's there's a there's a <laughs> there's a big open gaping gap between the appearance Chris Pranger just had on the, the podcast versus Reggie. There's definitely a medium happy middle that I'm sure would please both Nintendo and getting their message out there and also please um, podcasters like us and um, the wider uh, gaming media um, in terms of receiving a message and be actually being able to engage with these faces that Nintendo have thrust in front of our faces but we're never allowed to see outside of E3 yeah uh, I, I think also we have to make the point that the language gap and the language barrier is probably another big factor oh, in this absolutely. Um, and the way have no I power think the reason that <laughs> Right, but I also think the reason that Shuhei Yoshida is such an interesting guy is because he is in he is Japanese and he is running stuff over there, but he also speaks pretty much fluent English and he's able to talk to the media and talk to the American outlets and be able to articulate stuff that Reggie and people at NOA can't because he's in the trenches and he knows the development side and what's happening there because he's at the studios in japan going there all the time um and the problem on you know nintendo side is that really their executives don't speak that much english and iwata himself did uh surprisingly but he was never really available that much in those scenarios uh for one reason or another um and so yeah it, it does come down to that that problem that you know being a japanese speaker means it's hard to maybe propagate through western media and uh yeah maybe you know that's something they need to address but hey uh we had a long chat about this it was a very interesting topic and i uh, hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, i think we're gonna close out the show now uh so before we go um we are coming up very soon only a few episodes away from our 50th episode and uh and bali you have a little call out to the listeners in terms of emails uh so how about you go ahead with that yeah i mean 
Episode 50 is just, certainly from our point of view, it's just a massive deal. Like, it'll be a hundred weeks straight that we will have been doing this podcast. Um, and we're not going to stop at 50, don't get frightened. We're going to keep going, don't worry. Um, yeah. But we were thinking it'd be really great if, sort of, for episode 50, if, you know, if you're a listener at home and you and you have views on the podcast or what you think about what sort of what episode 50 means to you like have when did you start listening um have you listened to the whole i think it will be just under two years at that point at episode 50. so yeah. like how long have you been listening a year a year and a half um what do you like about us why did you start listening to us and um, why have you stayed <laughs> um more importantly and um, just some anything you have to say about the podcast that would um you think be a nice reflection that we could talk about um in our 50th episode because you know it's going to be it's going to be quite a milestone and it'd be nice to hear if that milestone's affecting anyone else yeah oh, where can they send those emails to bali oh that's a good point Emily. yes um, send, please send um your emails to this nintendo life at gmail.com Yes, indeed. Uh, we'll look forward to those, so uh, get typing. Get your hands on keyboards. Uh, you can also find us on other places of the internet. We're on Twitter. I am at LordNBZ over there. I'm also LordNBZ on the Miiverse. Uh, Bally, how I am you? at Ballyman91, B-A-L-L-Y-M-A-N-9-1. Um, I am also that name on the Miiverse. Um, and I'm actually going to be starting... Um, some Rayman Legends. So hopefully get some, Ooh, get some very exciting. posts out about that. Very good. Uh, yeah, you can find this podcast loads of different places on the internet. We're on iTunes, as always. Uh, you can subscribe there and get it downloaded every two weeks straight to your listening device uh, very, very easily. Uh, we're on Stitcher, which is a cool app. And, uh, you know, the YouTube version of this always goes out a couple of days after the uh, audio. But, uh, yes, it is always there and available uh, if that's your preferred method. And the podcast Twitter. Um, it's always good to follow the podcast Twitter because, you know, we do videos every now and then. Um, and it's it's a good place to find out when the most recent episodes are up and the videos and all the content and that's at tnl podcast at tnl podcast yep so uh that is pretty much going to be it uh for this show thank you very much everyone for listening and uh we'll be back again in a couple of weeks time uh, so until then thank you and goodbye interludes used in today's show were Forest Del Chivo from Guacamele, copyright Drinkbox Studios 2013, and Storm Eagle from Mega Man X, copyright Capcom 1993. <sighs> well, uh, I'm trying to make a natural, because <laughs> I made such a good natural go. sound. <sighs> <last time. sighs> Just visualise it. <laughs> Well, Alex, well, I <laughs> can't fucking do it. It sounds fine.